uh, Anne Marie ten Bakum from Design Museum Ghent. Good afternoon, everybody. Potash Plus was a revealing experience, not just for myself, being unfamiliar with the collection, but also for my colleagues who have been working in Design Museum Ghent for years. Revealing not only through <coughs> excuse me, rediscovery of a part of the collection, but especially through the deeper study of it. Some identifications that have lived for years proved to be wrong. The others were confirmed and refined through deeper research. Design Museum Ghent has some big names in its collection. Henri van der Velde, Emile Gallet, Dome, Lutz Witwe. But like any other museum, we also have a load of lesser known, unknown and anonymous gods in our reserves. Several of them remain there with good reasons which raises the question whether all private collectors should necessarily leave their entire collection in a museum. Coupled thereto, a second question prompts itself. How far can and must a museum go, considering the present day issues, in preserving the entire heritage for eternity? But these reflections are food for a separate Congress. Several objects in our reserves were screaming for attention and they received it more than they initially would have. The objects made by the unknown goddesses, the ladies of the Art Nouveau Applied Arts. I say reserves because no female artist is on display in the Art Nouveau section of the museum. Their clamor was so loud, you know how women can be, that Design Museum Ghent dedicated, decided to dedicate a research track to them. In collaboration with universities, academies, students, researchers and museums, a research track on female designers in Belgium will be set up. Of course, we are also interested in the proceedings of our European neighbours. I'd like to refer here to the interesting lecture of Julia, because everywhere in Europe things were stirring. Our ambition is to organize an exhibition on Belgian female designers in 2020, based on the research results as the first milestone in this ongoing project. The fine arts already have a tradition in this subject, and it is high time the applied arts catch up. Don't we all have one or more unknown ladies in our reserves? But let's get back to my cherished treasures. The present Design Museum Ghent exists now for more than 110 years. In December 1903, a group of Ghent-based industrial entrepreneurs and art lovers founded the Union des Arts Industriels et Décoratifs. Although primarily amateurs of period styles, they also purposely acquired contemporary furniture and objets d'art. Their choice was based on whether an object was useful for the museum, not whether it was from a male or female designer, nor whether it was indigenous or not. It is also not clear whether contemporary objects were bought to support an artist, but it might have been a motive. We encountered the first items made by female artists in a museum catalogue that was drawn up in 1909. It concerns an ashtray by Julie Sterpin and a vase by Marguerite van Biesbroek. The ashtray is now lost, the vase is still with us, and is dated 1908. A couple of years later, the museum purchased a dish or coin tray by Julie Sterpin, dated 1912. By that time, Julie had become the sister-in-law of Marguerite. She had married Marguerite's brother, Georges, an astronomer at the Royal Observatory in Brussels, and they were living two streets from his workplace. Marguerite and her parents had already moved there in 1910, leaving their Ghent home behind. The reason for their relocation from Ghent probably lies in Georges's work at the observatory. The same counts for their migration to the United States in 1919, where Georges was working at the Yerkes Observatory in Williams Bay, Wisconsin. The story of the Van Biesbroek sisters is far from complete but provides an interesting case for the research project on Belgian female designers. 
Marguerite was probably trained at the Ghent Industrial School, where her father was also a teacher, but then she went to study in Brussels at the École Bischofsheim, a school founded in 1865 especially for the professional education of girls. At Bischofsheim, several renowned artists and decorators, like Adolphe Crespin, were tutoring the girls in the new ideas on decorative arts that were emerging in Belgium and Europe, coming from people like Victor Horta and Philip Wolfers. Bischofsheim was not the only professional school for girls. In Brussels, there were also a school in Skarbeek, the École Professionnelle Communale Fernancoc, and at the Academy of Fine Arts, classes of decorative painting for women were created. Likewise, in other Belgian cities, similar schools were founded. The project, products and objects emerging from these schools were presented at local, national and international exhibitions and received overall great praise. As yet, not much research has been done on the professional education of girls and women in Belgium in the field of decorative arts. It's one of the topics we want to tackle in the research project. But now, back to the museum and its acquisitions. As the archives of the early years of the museum are scarce, no list of yearly acquisitions is available. We know from the report on the year 1913 that a committee held a shopping spree at the international exhibition held in Ghent that year. They explicitly went to the Palais des Travaux Féminins to buy contemporary bronzes, engraved leather works, and derrien ravissant, like ravishing trifles. What they bought exactly, they did not record. Shame on those men. Ten years later, the museum reopened in its new abode, the Hotel de Koning, where it is still located. An inventory of the rooms was drawn up, stating the room, the type of object, its material, and the maker, if known. No notes on acquisition, though. But still, it gives us an idea of what we had in store once, for since several objects have vanished from the collection through reasons better not discussed. The inventory teaches us that there was, beside the great lot of antique objects and furniture, a considerable collection of modern works. From female artists, there were objects in leather, wood, brass, painted porcelain, and smaller ceramics. Among those smaller ceramics resides a little vase by Blanche Vallejos. Originally, it stood on a stand in forged iron by Émile Robert, which is now lost. Possibly it was bought at the Ghent 1913 exhibition. Apart from her living in Paris around 1914, nothing substantial has been found on Blanche Vallejos so far. Two objects in leather are these boxes by Marguerite de Felice. They are just small, but very delicately tooled. We own more leather work by her, some leather cushions and handbags, but they still await further research. Marguerite de Felice was allegedly born in Paris 1872, where she died in 1933. Yet she is also noted to live in Bordeaux around 1995. By the First World War, she was famous for her leather work. During the war, she joined the opposition to the importation of German wares and turned to making toys and doll's houses to counter the German toy monopoly. In 1917, the studio, reporting from Paris, devoted three pictures to her doll's rooms, which were genuinely magnificent, and these words of praise. I quote, Having commenced to take part in the toy movement with self-made doll's houses, shops and so on, this artist, whose excellent leather work was well known to habitués of the art décoratif sections in the Paris salons, has now made a bolder departure in ensembles for night and day nurseries, indoor and outdoor furniture, the town, the country, the seaside. Her wide experience in all matters connected with applied arts, extending from the joiners to the glazier's craft, from textile fabrics to art paper, and embracing all the secrets of carving, inlaying, stenciling, embroidery, and so forth, finds happy expression in all the details combining for results at once artistic and practical, modern and in good taste. Marguerite de Felice was in 1913 vice president of the so-called International Art Union, the art section of the Student Union of the British American Young Women's Christian Association founded in 1909. 
Its object was to further the advancement of art among women. With this intention, the Union organized two exhibitions a year in Paris, one in the spring and one in the autumn, in this way affording an opportunity for young artists to make their work known. Similar associations to promote women in the arts saw the light in Belgium in the early years of the previous century. There was, for instance, Henriette Bauchet, teacher at the already mentioned École Professionnelle Communale Fernand Koch, and innovator of art education, who founded the first association for female decorators. There was the Société L'Art au Foyer, which sought to direct female artistic talent in search of earning a living towards interior decoration and applied arts. And then another group, the Société Les Arts de la Femme, founded in 1908 under the patronage of Queen Elizabeth, pour faciliter aux femmes des métiers d'art la vente rémunératrice de leurs travaux. Les Arts de la Femme had its own exhibition rooms in Brussels, where the achievements of female designers were on sale at a fair price for both buyer and seller. I recall to your memory Marguerite van Biesbroek and her sister-in-law Julie Sterpin, they too were members of Les Arts de la Femme, as we can derive from their presence on the stand at the Ghent International Exhibition of 1913. I believe that the labels at the bottom of Julie's coin tray and on another vase by Marguerite are from the exhibition shop of Les Arts de la Femme. The labels indicate the address of the maker and the price. This could mean that the Young Design Museum also bought objects in Brussels at Les Arts de la Femme. Like the topic of the professional education of girls and women in Belgium, these societies created to promote and support women in the applied and decorative arts are hardly studied. It's one other topic we plan to tackle in the research project. We now follow in Marguerite van Biesbroek's footsteps in 1919 and cross the big blue to encounter the last woman of this presentation. She con conceived this pretty dainty letter lady. It was hidden away in the reserves, a part of over a thousand objects belonging to a bequest of various types and quality of objects. The author's known name was not known till research in view of Patash Plus uncovered the identity. The said W. Hearing transformed into Elsie Ward Hearing, born as Elsie Ward in Fayette, Missouri, 1872. Until her death in 1923, she was a deserving sculptor of statues great and small, including portraits and statues for public spaces. Of her letter lady, several versions exist, which have been sold these past years. Like in many other cases, her biographical facts are scanty, but at least our letter lady has a maker attributed to her. Elsie Ward Herring was one of the last Art Nouveau ladies to enter the museum collection. It was in 1987, after a long period in which this style was neglected. With the revival in Art Nouveau acquisitions in the 80s, the interest in women artists did not revive. Let us start to amend for this defect and give them the attention they righteously deserve, based on their artistic merit and versatility. I thank you for your attention.